So you're thinking of buying a home, but you have no idea how much you can afford. I want to go over a little bit of the difference between lenders and lending institutions. Hi, my name is Ryan Cook. I am the broker owner of HomeSmart First Class Realty, and I want to share a little bit of information about you uh, with you on lenders and lending and the different platforms available because they, they can really tailor it to uh, your current situation, whether depending on your down payment or your credit score. So how do they determine interest rates, et cetera? It's really dependent on the Federal Reserve and they are the ones who control the supply of money. So obviously supply and demand is gonna, gonna change the value of the money. Also different lending institutions will have different programs. So that's gonna affect the interest rate, how much you need to put down. So in the end, it is very fluid, depending on what you're trying to do. There may be different lenders that are a better choice than others. Now, there are different types of lenders. There are actually six different types of uh, basic lenders. Your savings loans, commercial bank, it's all here in this chart that you can see on the screen. I'm not gonna read it to you because I'm gonna assume you can read, uh, but depending on what you're trying to do, there may be a better opportunity for you. Stuff like cooperative banks, uh, mutual savings banks, credit unions, you need to be a member. Uh, and, and based on being a member, it may have special benefits. If you don't become a member, you, you may not be able to borrow from them, okay? Then there are mortgage companies, which you've heard, Quicken Loans, Envoy Mortgage, uh, Northwest Mortgage or North Star Mortgage. Those are companies that only do mortgage origination. And so while they may not always have the best rate, sometimes they may be able to move a little bit faster because all they do is servicing mortgages. So they're, they're gonna be better at that in that regard. Uh, the next question I get an awful lot of, what is the difference between a lending officer and a mortgage broker? So a lending officer works for a lending institution, a bank, one of those you know five that were listed previously in, in your savings and loan, your commercial bank, your cooperative bank, savings bank, et cetera. They work there. They may not have what's called uh, an MLO, a mortgage loan originator or officer license number, uh, but the bank does. So they're employees of the bank. Now, they may have access to other uh, specialized programs in that bank. A mortgage broker, it's really the, the free agent of the lending uh, or the mortgage process. A good mortgage broker will develop relationships with banks across the country, and they'll be able to, to shop you around your credit score, your down payment, all that sort of stuff. They'll be able to shop that around to find the best suitor for you. So there's the difference between the two. Now, how are lenders paid? This comes up a lot of time that you think you're getting screwed. Not really, nothing's hidden. There's, they're either paid on the front, which are fees you can absolutely see, application, underwriting fees, etc. On the back, that's stuff you can't see. That may be uh, a commission and it's rolled into your mortgage. Uh, a yield spread premium, which is the difference between what they're borrowing the money from the Fed for and what they're lending it to you at. That's called the yield spread premium. And then your discount points, you can pay to lower your interest rate. Now, uh, now on the back, it, it, I made it you know seem as if you couldn't see it. Yeah, you don't see it exactly, but it shows up in your APR. So no matter what, what lender you go to, what lending platform you utilize, APR is how you're able to tell the difference between all the different lending platforms out there. That's it sort of normalizes it. So that's how you compare them. Now, local banks versus national banks. You get this all the time. People see the see the the uh, commercials and they go to the big bank. Um, the so the different the, the the big national banks. Your file moves from place to place to place. It may start off in Massachusetts, but then as it moves to the next stage, it may go to Ohio. It may go to Kentucky, it may go to Texas. You're never really sure who you're dealing with. It's just this big behemoth working your file through the system. Local banks um, can often have a lot more flexibility. So if you're on the hairy edge of your debt to income ratio, you have a, a loan officer there who can uh, take your file to the board and make your case. Say you're three payments away from finishing off your student debt uh, and right now your debt to income ratio is a little bit off, but four months from now, it'll be great. Your lending officer can go to the board and get that approved, whereas a national bank, not very likely. Uh, they may, they'll do portfolio loans. So they'll keep stuff in-house. So maybe they like everything about it, but something's just a little bit off, but they think all in all, you're a good risk. The property's a good risk. They may keep it as a portfolio loan, keep it in-house, meaning it never gets sold in the secondary market. Okay, And then local banks may also have uh, some short-term opportunities. So local banks need to keep certain ratios in line. They need to keep the money that they lend out to the community 
in ratio with the money that they're taking in from the community. And if those get off, they may offer some short-term special financing programs. They may lower the interest rate. They may uh, lower or eliminate closing costs. They may do a lot of things in order to, to bring uh, more, uh, to put more money into the community uh, than, they're, than they're taking in. Now, there are different types of loans. There are six basic types, your conventional, your VA, FHA, USDA, which is shown here. I'm not going to get into all the specifics, but really what program is available to you is going to be dependent on your credit score, how much you have to put down, and then depending on what you're purchasing, what percentage of your monthly income that payment will be. So conventional, it's going to be 28 to 33% of your uh, monthly income. Uh, and FHA can be 33 to 38%, so you get a little bit more flexibility. Some have more fees than others. FHA has quite a bit of fees, but they're very flexible. So if you have a credit score in the low 500s, well, if you put 10% down, you still may be able to uh, use an FHA mortgage, whereas conventional, there's no way. Uh, VA, another one, 45% of your monthly income, but you need to be a veteran. You have to get your certificate of eligibility. It's 100% financing, no PMI. But then USDA, 100% financing, but you need to put 20% down. So all, all different kinds and a good lending officer, a good mortgage broker will help you, help steer you into the right program that's most beneficial to you. Uh, mass housing, that's specific to Massachusetts, similar to Rhode Island housing. Uh, your, your credit score requirements can depend on how much you're putting down. No PMI, it's actually rolled into the loan. So it's a great program. FHA, similar to mass housing, uh, mass housing is going to have income limits, and the difference between the two is FHA is pretty strict on their uh, appraisal process. So if there's peeling paint, uh, broken shingles, a ripped screen, a broken you know window pane, you won't be able to finance with FHA, but mass housing you will. And then adjustable rate, your rate and everything's going to be dependent on how much you're putting down, your credit score, the term of loan, etc., how often it changes. Now there are other types of loans as well, construction that's gonna just dole out money to a builder as the as they need money and you're only gonna pay interest on it for the first 12 months, interest on the amount borrowed uh, for the first 12 months and then it changes over to conventional. You get your balloon, uh, generally only high net worth people are doing that. Generally there's a balloon payment due in five to 10 years so the interest only to start with and then there's a massive payment at the end. Negative amortization, which was actually the first mortgage I ever had. There were no disclosures at the time, so 1999, I didn't know I had a negative amortization mortgage until I went to sell the house and got my payoff statement and it was more than I borrowed. Uh, I've never seen anybody else in a negative amortization mortgage at the time. There was no internet where you could look that stuff up. There were no disclosures. I was uh, screwed. And then your reverse annuity, which is reverse mortgage, you got to be over 62. So that's, the, that's what's going on with the mortgages, lending, loan officers, all different types of programs. Uh, I am Ryan Cook, the broker owner of HomeSmart First Class Realty. Any other questions, please let me know. I have a quick sheet available to you that's going to go over all the requirements depending on those different programs so you can better understand uh, because I think it's important for you to understand that stuff so when you're talking to your mortgage broker or lending officer, uh, you are armed with the right information to have a meaningful discussion. Again, I'm Ryan Cook. Thanks so much for watching.